Okay, today is the 21st of April, 2015. The title is Carter's New Policies of Military Policies, Military Policies, Carter's New Military Policies Toward Iran and Afghanistan. June 1979 to November 1980. Now, my guest is Dave DeWitt, reporter for the Athens News. I am Robert Whaley, retired historian at Ohio University. And this is the Athens Speakout, number 328. Two weeks ago, we summarized the activities of the multinational banks, about 15 or 20 of them, in New York and London who collaborated with the activities of OPEC, the 14 oil producing countries. And both the banks and OPEC were able to pass on world inflation to Jerry Ford and Jimmy Carter's administration. And as far as that goes, the whole world and the whole United States. And that was a problem for Jimmy Carter locally because he could not solve the inflation problem. There was a third factor behind this global inflation, particularly in the United States, it was more intense than in Germany. And that was the hangover from the Vietnam War and the war debts from uh, Nixon's long war in Indochina. So Carter inherited an expanding national debt and unbalanced budgets. And he could do nothing about them in his four years. And uh, that ultimately was one of the factors in Carter's one-term presidency. But anyway, from 1976 to 77, he still believed in Keynesian economics and Keynesian principles. And for the short term, a short term debt could lead to a stimulus package and prime the pump and provide full employment. And that's the way it worked under Roosevelt and Truman and Eisenhower in the days when the United States had a very prosperous economy. But Lyndon Johnson and Richard Nixon uh, had said they were Keynesians, but they really sabotaged the whole idea of Keynesian economics because Keynes said you can have a short-term debt to fight unemployment, but you can't have 20 and 30 years of uh, long-term debts uh, to fight long-term wars. So that Johnson and Nixon, no matter what they said about Keynes, uh, was destroying it through the Vietnam War action. Keynesianism was about, well, Keynesian economists, Keynesian economists believed that 75% of the economy should be in private capitalist hands, but there should be about 25% of the GNP which had socialist government stimulus so that uh, in the post-war period, uh, the old rules of supply and demand were no longer relevant and they'll never become relevant. So that uh, the uh, automatic stimulus depended upon uh, the Federal Reserve Bank uh, advancing credits to keep the real estate building, uh, building going, and the uh, unions kept the wages going up, so that in the first couple of years under Truman and Eisenhower, and even up to Kennedy, the economy was in prosperity because all classes 
shared in the inevitable growth of the American economy. So uh, after that, the United Kingdom with its independent pound and the uh, Germans with the Deutschmark uh, began to turn in their paper dollars for gold and uh, Nixon had to f eliminate the gold exchange standard in 1971 because of the perpetual growing debt. But the free market did work on the old gold standard from 1713 to 1914, but the First World War left all of the great powers in debt and none of them could pay the war debts and the United States dollar became the number one currency in uh, 1919 at the end of the war. And uh, the British, the French, the Russians, the Germans, everybody had to sell their gold off to the United States. So the gold was, the United States was the only gold power at the end of World War II. And at the Bretton Woods Conference, uh, Keynes and the Department of Treasury under Roosevelt said, well, okay, we'll create a new gold exchange. The other countries can borrow paper dollars fixed at $35 an ounce, and these paper dollars are as good as $0.35, cent, uh, 35 cents, uh, an ounce gold under the old free market. Well, it was no, it was no longer fixed after 1971. And so uh, Keynesian uh, economics is in deep trouble today. Well, I guess that takes care of uh, the financial uh, uh, situation that we had in Carter's first two years. And to say more about the gold, as the uh, gold prices, I mean, as the uh, oil consumption was going up, uh, Japan and uh, France and Great Britain uh, was able to uh, at least limit inflation by establishing a G7. That is the Federal Reserve Bank and the central banks of these seven powers limited the inflation by fixing the interest rates. So it couldn't vary much more than one or two percent on an annual basis. And that kept, it kept the inflation in check more or less except in the United States, where the war economy uh, kept the inflation going higher and higher. And as a result, uh, Japanese currency, French currency, British currency uh, were all gaining in value in the new free market after gold was devaluated. What is this now? I didn't quite get that. Oh, is this the, is this the full time? Oh, we're ending. Yeah, we're ending. That's right. We have to end the introduction. Could I, yeah. could I jump in yeah. with a question? Yeah, go ahead. Um, are you surprised to hear uh, so-called libertarians in recent years arguing for a return to the gold standard? I think they're nuts. <laughs> I think they're nuts, too. They're living in a world that no longer exists. Now, that world did exist from 1790 when the United States was founded up to 1914. Mm -hmm. But World War I and the Communist Revolution and the Nazi Fascist Revolution destroyed the gold standard. No country could stay on gold. There wasn't enough gold to pay for the costs of World War I. So the Germans couldn't pay for reparations and eventually Adolf Hitler said, okay, we're taking over and we're going to have paper currency called the Reichsmark. Mm -hmm. And the Soviets did that in 1917. They just confiscated the gold ruble, said, okay, we're, we're communists. We have 100% totally owned by the state. So if there wasn't enough gold back then, there couldn't be anywhere near enough gold now. The gold is limited. Yeah. Now, it's true, South Africa keeps adding a little bit. There, we'll say there were, uh, just for offhand, maybe there were 800 tons of gold in 1914. It might have increased to 1,000 tons of gold worldwide. But each bank cannot maintain a gold as their reserve. They have to have paper currency. 
No one knows how much gold was really left in Fort Knox. Right. In theory, yeah, there are gold big... bars there. Yeah. But there are a lot. Now, here's where the libertarians might be, right? It's very possible that Chase uh, Bank and uh, Goldman Sachs have actually uh, bought some of this gold mm -hmm. and, and shipped it to Switzerland or shipped it to the Cayman Islands. That's Offshore somewhere. Yeah, who knows yeah. Where, where the, whether Fort Knox really has that gold or not. The CIA may know, and maybe again they don't. <laughs> yeah. But we now have, what, $18 trillion debt. Right. 18. How are the libertarians going to... How yeah, are they going return, to compete yeah. with, with, with Germany and... and, and, and uh, see, Germany is solvent. Uh, Saudi Arabia is solvent. Japan is solvent. China is solvent. So a return to the gold standard would put America in an extreme economic disadvantage. No, it, it just globally. Means, right now, right now, the Chinese money is pegged to the American paper dollar. Yeah. And when the American paper dollar inflates, we'll say six percent this year, the Chinese paper dollar goes up at the same rate, six six. Now, the Germans don't have to do that. I see. The German mark can increase. And you can look in the New York Times between the price of oil, the price of the euro, in other words, the franc and the Italian and the Gilda, seven currencies, have all been pooled, and that's called the euro. Right. So if you watch the euro dollar exchange, it doesn't change too much. It was once up to a dollar thirty, and it's kind of drifted back to a dollar ten now. Originally, the euro was supposed to be pegged at one to one. Right. But the uh, Germans are able to maintain a hard currency. Now the Greeks and the Italians don't like that, but Merkel Merkel has the power to uh, control the value of the uh, euro compared to the dollar. And they can inflate along with the dollar, or they can uh, change it by two percent or one percent. Mm -hmm. But there's got no. Got, there's not going to be any great run on the bank because they're all in debt. Yeah. In other words, uh, Merkel is still dependent on Russia and the Middle East for go for oil imports. So the 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 price of oil, the wholesale price of oil, and the banking rates, exchange rates, between New York and London. London is independent. Japan is really a fake. It, they're dependent on the American dollar. Yeah. And, and, and as the American dollar inflates, the Japanese yen inflates more because it's a small country. The Japanese are, are treading water, and they're worried about China because China has more and more space to expand their industry. Sure, yeah, geographically. Yeah, yeah, but the Chinese don't want to call it in because how would they sell their cars? Oh, yeah. If, yeah. They, if they say, well, we're going we're gonna to close sure, you down. Yeah. I'd, what about, and I don't want to get too far off track here, but uh, I did see an item in the news recently where uh, several of the European countries joined into the Asian bank well, this that is was formed this is an experiment. by China recently. Yeah, this is an experiment. Yeah. In other words, uh, Australia may have joined, but we now have a, an American counter proposal, the TTP, the trans Oh, yeah. They the, want to yeah. keep they want to keep Japan and Australia in the American orbit. So is that what the TPP is it's, attempting to do in part? They're afraid least, of China. They're afraid of China. Is to uh, act as a counterweight to the move that China made recently with the Asian bank. That's right. I see. But uh, the Chinese have a, 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 an impolution problem. Oh, yeah, we, well, absolutely. What, in other words, they're not rising because they're sinking in their own garbage. Yeah. <laughs> so the global warming is the real problem of all powers. Well, that's a world problem. And yeah. Unless you negotiate on that, it doesn't make any difference. What, what difference does it make if China or the United States pulls the plug in 50 years? If, if the United States is drying up and China is getting more and more polluted and the Japanese are, are, are dumping the uh, 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 nuclear energy into the Pacific Ocean, what's going to go first? The fish? The elephants? 
right. spotted owl <laughs> or oxygen. Are we going to have to have a gas mask? Yeah. <laughs> What's, well, that's what Gore talks about. Sure. You know, his yeah. movie. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the, ice, the ice truth. caps are melting. Yeah. The seas are rising. Florida's going to go into water. Yeah. We don't know which, which is going to... Which is going to come go first? Yeah. Well, apparently, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, we we could have a whole other show on that. Go but, one. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And yeah. climate change. But anyway, yeah. to get to our first question back on Carter, then. Yeah. The first question here is: Do you want to say anything about uh, Carter's uh, first two years uh, and his relationship with Cyrus Vance, Secretary of State? And it's a big new Brzezinski, which we covered before in the past, of how Carter was caught between these two advisors when the Iranian-Afghan problems arose because uh, Vance was essentially a pacifist who wanted to keep out of war, and Zabrinsky was putting the pressure on to expand into uh, Iran and uh, Afghanistan with CIA yeah. support. Well, yeah, uh, Brzezinski um, actively uh, supported um, Polish solidarity and, and Afghan right. resistance right. Uh, to the Soviet invasion. Yeah. That's really what we're going to talk about today, but we just yeah. set the background of, of the personalities before. Right, yeah. Oh, and I and can, I can summarize. In, yeah, yeah, we're going to get into the tales in another question. Okay. Yeah, I mean, simply put. Okay, well, let's go on to the second question then. Okay. Did Zabrinsky's negotiations in Poland help or hinder Carter's overall objective of peace in the Middle East? And there you have a real debate. Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. And I suppose I would... I would probably fall, I, and I wouldn't criticize Brzezinski's negotiations as being wrong necessarily for Poland, but wrong for peace in the Middle East, yeah. I mean, I don't think that, that I don't think that you could, I mean, he was a hardliner, and he was pushing through his negotiations to take a hardline stance, and that's not typically the path toward peace you know, drawing the lines in the sand and supporting Afghan resistance uh, to the Soviet invasion. Okay, um, I think that's a fair analysis. Kind of a rabble rouser. Right. Um, well, you can argue both ways about that. And that question is really still open because Brzezinski is still alive and well, and he's published his memoirs but there are lots of gaps in these memoirs. Yeah. And there are fans of Brzezinski, and there are critics of Brzezinski. And, uh, but it's, it, it, there's no doubt that from Carter's own administration, uh, Brzezinski was a disappointment. But since Carter lost anyway, there's no use of Carter getting on the platform and denounce, blame it all on Brzezinski. Sure. So it's a little more difficult because Carter himself was, was caught between a hawk and a dove. And yeah. his original instinct was to go with Vance. Well, yeah, I think he was ideological, but he when was... When you come to the uh, salt too thing... Right. And Brezhnev is saying, hey, Carter, you're not, you can't keep this in a closed box. You can't be talking to China and talking and denouncing the Cubans in Africa. Right. It, it just restricting this to nuclear talks only. See, that was Brzezinski's idea. We can talk about detente, mm -hmm. but we can't talk about detente across the board. Detente only means we're going to try and limit nuclear bombs. I see. He wanted to try to compartmentalize. He wanted to, he wanted to keep Poland. He wanted to keep That's, Hungary. Yeah. He wanted to keep expanding NATO mm -hmm. and putting the pressure on the Soviet Union because he had this ideological fix. It's Catholicism and capitalism on one side sure. and communism on the other. And his roots were in Poland anyway. His roots were deep in Poland. Yeah. Yeah, so that's how, how he gets... Now, Carter, Carter needed the Catholic vote, so he can't openly repudiate Zabrinsky as being a, 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 an anti-communist, uh, pro-Polish 
because there were lots of Polish voters in the United States, Hungarian voters, and they were in both Republican and Democratic parties. So Carter had to be very cautious about uh, publicly denouncing either one of them. Oh, sure, <laughs> yeah. So that's a tight, ro that's a tight rope to walk. That's a tight rope to try to, to balance on and. Uh, all right, well, let me talk a, a little bit, unless, unless you have a, another question here. You have another no, question? That's, that's I, I would like to talk about uh, more detail about what Zubrinsky uh, thought specifically about the Soviet Union and Moscow and Poland. You see, in 1956, there was a Polish communist leader by the name of Vladislav Gomoka. And he forced Nikita Khrushchev to grant the Polish Communist Party a certain amount of concessions because Russia had to have a secure railway line from Moscow through Warsaw to keep East Berlin. Right. So uh, Khrushchev had it back down and Gomoka was saying, I'm a Pole, a native Pole. Now, Stalin was able to appoint a Soviet general to be in command of the Polish People's Republic. Well, Gomoka says, I want, to be, I want that job. Mm -hmm. And then we're going to see how loyal this Polish communist is to the Moscow brand. of yeah, that's, He's got bargaining power now. That's the importance of the Gomoka so-called revolution. But anyway, that occurred in, in 1956 because uh, Khrushchev was uh, tottering in a sense because the Hungarians, the Chinese, uh, the Americans were now denouncing Khrushchev and it was Khrushchev who denounced Stalin, mm -hmm. trying to blame all of this on Stalin. So because of the atomic bomb, he was ready to talk about de-Stalinization, detente and peaceful coexistence. Mm -hmm. And that, so, the, so Gomolka was kind of inching toward the West by, the, by this demand, you see. So uh, now the rest of Eastern Europe, the Hungarians and the Czechs, had less bargaining power than Poland because of their strategic location. Czechoslovakia and Romania and Bulgaria were off on the sidelines. So the Soviet Union could be tough on Czechoslovakia and Bulgaria, you know. They kept the Iron Curtain iron down there. But uh, uh, the loyalty of Poles and the loyalty of East Germans was deeply suspect. In other words, <laughs> Khrushchev knew that the Germans really didn't believe in the communist line, and he knew that the Poles really didn't believe in the communist line. So he's got to be a little cautious. Well, there was a second Polish upheaval. It occurred in, in 1950, uh, uh, 1970, when Gomolka was ready to retire. And there was a strike, a Polish shakeup, a strike in, in the shipyards. And uh, they wanted to appoint Edward Gierek as the new Polish communist, and he was going to be the first secretary to replace Gomolka because Gomoka was getting old and had to retire, and Brezhnev is now in charge. Well, these rioters in Poland, I mean in, 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 uh, in Posen, are talking about prices. They say, well, we have to pay high prices for oil, and we would like some concessions with trade to the West. We want to sell Polish ham and Polish coal to West Germany, and they'll pay dollars and uh, euros and marks, and we're going to have 50% of our trade with the West and 50% with the East. Mm -hmm. Well, Brezhnev had no choice. He had to give in because Gierek uh, then uh, said, well, we'll borrow the money from France and Germany to pay for these rising uh, oil prices. And you see, what Moscow did was raise the price the same way OPEC did. Right. But, but the Poles had to pay high prices in either case. So uh, 
Yeah, so they were. So, stuck. so the the so says, okay, well you you get the French German loan and you pay it off with Polish work. <laughs> so anyway, Pol Pol Polish government is getting more concessions, and then Gierek gets concessions to the Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. No more censorship. We're we're gonna bring out the Catholic clerics, and we're gonna have free speech. Yeah. So, so what could what could Brezhnev say? <laughs> so uh, Brezhnev now coming to power in Carter's administration is saying, well, we can keep uh, visiting Poland, and uh, I can visit the Vatican, and we're going to get more autonomy and more freedom for the Polish Communist Party, and there's nothing Soviets can do about this. Now, gosh darn it. Gotta move that over. Okay. So anyway, we come now to the Carter administration, and we come to January nineteen seventy nine, and. January of 1979, the Shah has to resign. Ah, yes. And the Soviet Union thinks that there's an opportunity to invade Afghanistan in December of 79. <clears throat> and Zabrinsky is the hardliner. And Zabrinsky is saying the CIA should be mobilized to intervene in this revolution. And Vance is saying, go slow, let's just humor the Ayatollah and uh, this revolution will pass and so forth and so on. So uh, neither of them, none of them, Carter, Zabrinsky, and Vance had any understanding of the real causes of the Iranian revolution. It was based on Iranian domestic problems. The, the, the argument over oil concessions and the Shiite Sunni Islam split. And Brzezinski had this crazy idea that, well, the Soviets are really behind this revolution in, in Iran. He didn't have any evidence of that. He just had a suspicion. Mm -hmm. There was a small communist party in Iran. The Iranians had a kind of a fledging democracy where there was some kind of uh, free speech. So uh, the discussion is in the wind. So I originally was very hostile to Brzezinski because I was a fan of peace. But it was a very subtle bias. I would say now that I was 51% for Vance and 49% for Zabrinsky because there is a certain truth to Brzezinski's argument. His argument was if you keep this pressure up, the Soviet Union will be forced to make concessions. And the argument for the hard line argument against Moscow was what happened in Czechoslovakia in 1968. Although Khrushchev and Brezhnev gave concessions to Poland and Hungary, when the Czechs started talking in 1968 about uh, uh, socialism with a human face and peaceful coexistence and so forth, Brezhnev intervenes and crushes the new line of the Czechoslovak Communist Party. Mm -hmm. And suddenly then the anti-communist uh, propaganda in the West increases and the uh, Soviet Union can't be trusted. Another problem, do you have a uh, comment? 
All right, we need to take a station break. Well, we have to stop here. Uh, we're talking about uh, Carter's uh, slip into conflict with Brzezinski and his conflict in Afghanistan and Iran in this decisive year of 1979. And Zabrinsky had a good argument on uh, uh, Czechoslovak problem. And my guest is uh, Dave DeWitt, and he and I are discussing the failure in the last two years of the Carter administration. Anyway, I was going to say the second uh, case that Zabrinsky had for a hard line was that the Soviet Union was supporting the PLO and making trouble against Israel. Yeah. Uh, and, and to financing uh, terrorists under, underneath the uh, radar screen, sort of. Thing. So naturally, uh, the Jews were sympathetic to a hard line against the Soviet Union and the PLO in particular. Sure. Robert, aren't these things sometimes just diversions? It depends upon which side you're on. Diversion from whose point of view? Exactly. Where are you sitting? Where are you sitting and which chair are you looking at? <laughs> exactly. But what I'm saying is a lot of times they just want to divert one country's attention from another or they want to divert uh, you from uh, you know paying attention. Yeah. Well, one of the, well, that's interesting. Well, because okay, you have Brzezinski making this kind of anti-communist argument and using this anti-communist rhetoric that by that time you know had been used for you know thirty, forty years, um, pretty regularly. Well, the Soviet Union is still in existence. Well, Nixon yeah, is still in existence. Oh, uh, absolutely. And the Cold War is still well. But my question about the Iranian Revolution. Well, because he's using these suspicions that he has that Russia is behind it. As I understand the Iranian Revolution, a lot of it had to do with the recent economic contraction that the country experienced in 77, 78, and just kind of a feeling amongst the Iranians themselves that the Shah was a puppet of Western yeah, powers. That's right. And they didn't really represent the Iranian people. That's the interests. Iranian point of view. Right, right. And so. Was do you think do you that remember? Brzezinski was just you know, using like the, the distraction, no, Brzez, or do you think he was a true believer? Oh, wait, a minute. no. Let's 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 clarify this. Okay. The Shah had to resign. This was a shock to the conservatives in Washington D.C. They thought the Shah would stay forever. The and Shah, then the Iranian people just loved him. Hmm. The Iranian people are divided by class and religion and economic interests the same as anybody. Right, right. So you had, let's look at this, let's look at the, here, let's look at this. I have a little figure here. Of okay. Who were who the revolutionaries? Who were the supporters? Let's jump ahead here. have to go backwards a bit. I was going to look at the map here, but we'll go to the backwards for the map. Here. But I got a little chart here. Right, because the the Islamists and Khomeini were able to take advantage. All right, okay, here's, the, here's this little table I was looking for. Okay. You had right-wing factions and left-wing factions. Now, this uh, is within Iran? This is when the revolution breaks out. Okay. The Shah is gone. Yeah. Already well, resigned. Yeah, but the, the Iranian society is complex. The Shah is only one man. Right. Okay. So on the right, you have the Imperial Party loyalists, monarchists by conviction. Okay. We love the Shah and we want the Shah's son to continue. Then you had the Imperial Army. Well, it was the United States money that kept an Imperial Army going, okay? Which way are these Army officers going to go if the Shah steps down? Who's going to be their boss? Yeah. Then you had uh, the so-called Imperial Guards. That's like the United States Secret Service. They were the little cl clique of guards that protected the Shah's persona, okay? And then you had Savak, 
Do you know what SAVAC is? I'm, I don't. The United States has a CIA. And when Eisenhower and the British overthrew uh, Mossadegh, mm -hmm. they said, well, the Shah needs a protection by a secret police, which he oh. called SAVAC. So the CIA sends officers to Iran and train all of these ruthless secret police to arrest anybody who disagrees with the Shah. Right. So the Communist Party of Iran was being watched by Savak. Mm -hmm. Well, now who's going to control Savak if the Shah steps down? And this is where the CIA has natural ties. They know who, they, who the officers are of Savak. Well, now Carter's not going to come out and say, okay, <laughs> I think Savak is doing a good job because the revolutionaries are start publishing it publicizing how cruel and Carter was, yeah. Yeah, Carter was talking about, had about gotten, human rights to human rights right <laughs> and well, the Shah had and they thought right that 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 might quell some of the but right. the Shah had begun right. to be so become very brutal in his right last so years. so Brzezinski and Vance and Carter are not going to say anything about Salvak they pretend it doesn't exist yeah but Brzezinski knows there is a CIA and now maybe I can Get the CIA in there and work with Savak in because order that's to. That's what Brzezinski would that's prefer. Is that's to what he's hoping. But that's, that. not in, that's not in the record. You, you don't have any documents yeah. from Savak and CIA relations. Right. That's all in the deep six somewhere. Right. <laughs> of course. But you, but you do have an, an interest. What happens to Savak? Okay, so that's the right. What about yeah, that, the left? Well, all right, there's one more faction I want to say. Okay. Fifth the regular local police who oh, controls okay. the city streets of, the of Tehran. Police. Okay. Now on the left, you got the official Communist Party of Iran. Secondly, you have a little Marxist front group called the Islamic Party, the Islamic Republican Party of Afghanistan. Well, are they being secretly financed by Moscow? Unknown question. Brzezinski and, would suspect so. Yeah. Then you have Hezbollah. Okay. Yeah. A, a terrorist organization of militant Shiite agents who are sent to Lebanon and Syria and Iraq to support various Arabs against the state of Israel. Now... You've got the so-called guerrillas, terrorists, militants, jihadists. They're given different labels by the United States, depending on how sympathetic they are to this uh, left-wing recruitable factions. Now, these are possibly enemies of Israel, possibly enemies of the United States. Now, the... Shiite clergy. Well, whose side are they going to be on? They have faith in the Ayatollah as a symbolic leader. Mm -hmm. So when the Shah departs, these students who are somewhat socialistic, somewhat anti-big business, anti-oil, say, well, we're going to make the Ayatollah our, our nominal leader, and maybe we'll be able to control the Ayatollah. You see, that's how the revolution grows. You don't know who's who in a revolution. <laughs> okay? So you have, uh, again, w which I've always stressed in teaching history, you've got a box. You've got four sides. You've got the military factor, the political factor, the economic factor, and the ideological dimension. And a good president, whether he's... Franklin Roosevelt, or whether he's a weak president like Jimmy Carter, have to keep these four factions, elites, in balance in some way. Now, Zabrinsky's on the side of ideology, mm -hmm. okay? And the CIA is on the side of the military. Well, they have some agreements and they have some conflicts behind the scenes, okay? So I guess that's, that's enough on the uh, 
factions, unless you have some questions about this, how, how, how the American State Department, the CIA, Brzezinski, Vance, really don't understand what's going on in Tehran. They're yeah. totally blind. It's, it's exactly like the Russian Revolution. In 1917, when the Russian Revolution broke out, the Germans, the French, the British, they all knew they were anti-capitalists. Well, how are you going to stop Bolshevism? Yeah. First of all, you've got to know the language. How many Americans had studied Farsi? How many Americans <laughs> knew the difference between a Shiite and a Sunni? Or know it now. In other words, Muslims were just just a kind of a, a blank spot on the map. <laughs> it seems to me like the Shiites or the the uh, uh, the Khomeini's Islamist movement was underestimated. Oh, it was all underestimated. From, both, from all sides, from the Shah side, from the United States side. Well, the Shah just assumed that he, he had American money, he had American munitions, and these clerics... What difference is what, what they believe? Yeah. But, but they had ideals that, same as Muslims. Muslims and Christians have ideals, and Jews have ideals. The idealistic Jew, the idealistic Christian, the idealistic Muslim, you don't live by bread alone. Money's not everything. Now, if you're a capitalist, you say, we can buy anybody. We don't care anything about religion. They all can be bribed. Well, that's a cynical view of the world. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now, Carter was, yeah. not, Carter was a true believer in Christian values. Yeah. <laughs> okay, any, any, any comment on that? Do you want me to put up that Iranian map? I can I, 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 yeah, we're All just right, about to go to the map. There it is. Yeah, okay. Uh, what I want to show on this map, and it can't be seen too well from that long distance, but uh, you have up there on the northern part of uh, the Iran state, the tail end of the Caspian Sea. This Caspian Sea is a highway to the large Soviet Union way to the north. And uh, the major river in uh, in Russia is up on the northern part of that uh, Caspian Sea. It's called the Volga River. And if you sail up the Volga River from the Caspian Sea, you go all the way up to Moscow. Now, in World War II, down here where this little red spot is, I don't know whether you can see it, is the mouth of the Tigris-Euphrates over here on the east end of that map Far east is Iraq. It's all in white here. But the, blue, the uh, colored line is the border between Iraq and Iran. And over in the middle of Iraq are the Tigris-Euphrates uh, rivers. And they flow down to this red spot, which is called Kuwait on this map. Kuwait is an independent Arab state. And Lend-Lease used to sail from the United States up the Persian Gulf and up to the, the base where the British had the Abaddon refinery. The Abaddon refinery is at the mouth of these two rivers. Uh, you just have to kind of imagine this. And then the Persians or the Iranians had no railroad in 1941. And the United States lend lease people built a railway from, from the mouth of the... Uh, uh, Tigris Euphrates and the Abaddon refinery, all the way up to Tehran, which is the capital, a little red spot on this map, just south of uh, the Caspian Sea. And then, of course, the Iranians had a small railroad that went from the capital, Tehran, up to the Caspian Sea. And uh, they used to uh, trade with Russia since medieval times through the Caspian. Well, in any case, the United States got involved in Persia briefly, or in Iran briefly, uh, in World War II, and it was Lend-Lease that came through uh, Iran that saved Stalin's armies from Hitler's invasion. And that's the importance of the Battle of Stalingrad, because Stalingrad is on the Volga River, and uh, 
Hitler said, I got to have that city to cut off this lend lease. And Stalin said to his troops, you hold on to Stalingrad at the point of death, because if, we, if that thing is ever cut off, we're going to have to, we'll have to lose the war. So Stalingrad became the decisive battle of World War II One of the because, of, because of the Iranian history. lifeline, right? Mm. Okay, so the Caspian Sea is a major point on this map and uh, connecting the Mississippi River of Russia to the Volga and World War II and lend lease diplomacy. And this is at the mouth of the Tigris-Euphrates rivers and the Abaddon refinery, BP, was located there way back in 1909. So the Persian Gulf on the map, it, keep the map up there, is down at the south of Iran, is the strategic lifeline of the entire country and the neighboring Arab states. So you have to know the Caspian Sea, the Persian Gulf, and uh, then the black lines are the boundaries of the Tigris-Euphrates River and the red spot at the Abaddon refinery. And then we, the uh, boycott of the Iraqi oil and the Saudi oil depended on the oil companies of Aramco down in Saudi Arabia. And the oil prices were controlled by OPEC through three major powers, Saudi Arabia, Iran, and Iraq. These were the big powers in the OPEC financial organization. And now, what's going to happen to Iraq and what's going to happen to the BP uh, oil company in light of this revolution? And what is the MI5 and the CIA going to do? Who can they... Uh, uh, fine to substitute for the Shah. Now, I keep talking about Persia because Persia was the classical name of the people of Iran. And on this map, uh, one of the black spots there is the old capital called Perseus, down here way south of Tehran. And that was uh, the capital of the Persian Empire when the Greeks invaded uh, back and forth in ancient times, they called the country Persia, and Persia was known in the Western languages, Greece uh, and Italy and the uh, United States and Britain and France, until 1935, when the uh, Shah of Iran, and there was still a Shah then, changed the name of his country officially to Iran. Iran is what the people call themselves, they speak the Iranian uh, language. And that was Hitler's idea of the Aryans. Hitler thought that the Aryans were originally Iranians, and all of the people of Europe spoke a dialect of this ancient Iranian tongue. And it's also known as Farsi, which is a Hindu word. That was uh, what the uh, old Zoroastrian religion uh, were called. They were called Parsis. Mm -hmm. So when Islam took over Iran, uh, the ruling language was Farsi or Persian, and Persian is the official language, or Farsi is the official language of the uh, rulers, the kings of Kabul. Now Kabul is on this map as one of the spots and this is the border, this is the city halfway between the Afghan frontier and the Pakistani frontier and, and central Persia. And the problem of Iran is that there are five independent languages. Iranian is the dominant one, but when you get to Afghanistan, Farsi is spoken and Indian languages are spoken. So there's been a long-term rivalry between Iran culture and Hindu culture, the Zoroastrian culture. But anyway, Iran became officially Islam in the 630s, and Afghanistan became official. So they were united in religion, but divided by language and ethnics and, and, and history, okay? So anyway, uh, what else do you want to say about this map? 
Well, we mentioned Kuwait, which became a war in 1991 when the American CIA and Army rescued a Sunni Kuwait from Saddam Hussein, who mm -hmm. wanted to go down the Tigris-Euphrates and eliminate a American base there, and the Americans won that war in the first Gulf War in 1991. And then to the north uh, of Iran, you got uh, some states up there called Turkmenistan, Azerbaijan. These were Soviet states, and the Turkmenistan people are Turks, same as the people in Turkey. And these became Soviet republics, Azerbaijan, and Azerbaijani is half Turkish and half Iranian speaking. And then you have the real Turkey way over on the eastern side of this, this map. Uh, in the corner, uh, Turkey's on this map, north of Iraq, Iraq, and Pakistan way down in the south, uh, east corner. And this is the west corner, and Afghanistan is to the east, all mountainous. So I guess we've outlined the geography of this region. Now I'd like to say something about the population. The population of Iran, and this is important to the fate of these revolutions, in 1941 was 14.7 million people. The Iranian population by 1953, when Eisenhower got involved, increased to 17 million people. Today it is 77 million people. So Iran is a major nation state. Afghanistan, Afghanistan's population was 33 million in 1979. It was only 12 million. It's 33 million today in, in 2013. So the Iraqi population is about the same size as Afghan, 32 million. So there's a population factor on here. The United States can't control uh, Iran with a few CIA agents. They haven't got enough people. And Russia can't control Iran with a few Soviet agents. That's just unthinkable. Now, Afghanistan, well, you, you, can, you can subvert the Afghan disunited tribal peoples. Yeah. That's, that's, that's what this is all about. So anyway, do we have to say anything more about uh, the CIA and the oil? Yeah, let's talk about the oil. Let's review that a bit. The Shah was cooperating with BP and the CIA. And Aramco, had a concession with the Saudis of 50-50% of the profits. And what the Mossadegh revolution was all about is that BP wanted to keep the uh, Iranian profits only 17%. So the CIA invaded and helped the British preserve BP at, at uh, higher rates of profit. But the consortium had to pay the Americans and BP that had 40% of the share had to give 8% to the Gulf Oil Company in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, 14% to Royal Dutch Shell, 6% to a French company, and then Aramco, which had uh, uh, four sub-companies, they had 32%. Uh, they had uh, Standard Oil of New Jersey, Standard Oil of New York, and Standard Oil of Chevron, uh, Standard Oil of California, and Texaco. They all got 8%. So the oil profits are divided into smaller companies. And nobody can take over Iran or Saudi Arabia and get all of the oil wells and all of the oil fields. You have to do business. BP has to do business. Shell has to do business with the Iranian oil companies and OPEC and with the Iraqi oil companies. So there's a new ball came with the creation of uh, OPEC and the 
Iranian Revolution is beginning to talk about the profits because the oil workers, and there are oil workers at Abaddon, are saying, well, we're going to be able to get higher wages when this revolution is complete. So the British and the Americans really didn't know who's who and what's what when this revolution unfolded. They didn't know who they could trust. So the CIA and the State Department are dealing in a blind situation. So anyway, January 1978, the students demand democracy. Forever, we have two minutes remaining. Okay, well, I suppose we can stop January of 1978 and the beginning of the Shah's fall and Carter's decisive intervention in 79 and this introduction is a little longer than we had expected but we'll continue this again thank you for coming thank would you, you for would me. you like to give your impression of this summary um yeah well i think uh we've talked about the the roots of the iranian revolution and um i think what i would characterize is uh an uh, a crucial underestimation of the power of the Islamists in Khomeini, uh, which he will later... And the Iranian assert. society and, as a whole. And the Iranian society as a whole, absolutely. Yeah. Right. And uh, we'll get into more of that next time. That's what we hope to do. Okay. Thank you for well, coming. Well, thank you for having me, Professor. Uh, okay.